Hello lovely people. I have decided to film this video with a migraine because uh, uh, I'm pretending it's my choice and not that my migraine just slapped me in the face with no warning because I need to feel some kind of agency over my body, okay? Yeah, uh, it's because I'm edgy. Okay, fine. I'm edgy like your non-racist grandma who loves everyone and flirts with waiters indiscriminately. I'm basically a sphere. Speaking of grandmas, this week is Migraine Awareness Week in the UK and I have been posting a video every day on my new TikTok account talking about the evil things. So hey, click the top link in the description to watch that. Why does that relate to grandmas? Oh, because it's bloody TikTok and it makes me feel like one. Also, yes, I have seen the, really, Jessica, you're getting a TikTok right when it gets banned in many countries on my community tab, but you know, I never claimed to be current. Look at me. I've already made a video on this channel talking a bit about migraines, what they are, why they happen, etc. But I didn't go into what can be done to actually help. So here is a video about migraine cures that you should never try. I know sometimes migraines make you feel really, really desperate, but no, don't do it. You see, in awful news, I finally had the appointment at the migraine clinic that I've been waiting two years for. Don't you dare use that as a reason against universal healthcare, certain Americans, because I didn't have to sell my house to pay for it, and that's pretty important too. Anyway, this migraine doctor wants me to do a month-long detox from my migraine painkillers, meaning I'm just left with regular painkillers, which don't take the edge off. Apologies for yelling, it's just that my brain is trying to abort mission and escape through my nose. Hmm. Ah, so what non-medications can I try to stop the pain otherwise? Well, let's look at some of the past cures. Warning, warning, this video will include graphic descriptions of ill-advised medical treatments. If you hold traumas in regard to medical treatments, please do tread carefully. Ancient times. We'll begin with the good, in case those of you who haven't quite heeded my warning yet are still here. In the Hippocratic works from around 460 to 370 BCE, there are a few references on what to do. Hi! Did you bring me a drink? Oh, you're so sweet. I love you so much. Thank you. In the Hippocratic works from around 460 to 370 BCE, there are a few references on what to do in cases of headache, but also a warning to note symptomatic causes. One should recognise headaches that originate from physical exercises, running, walking, hunting, or any other inconvenient fatigue or venereal excess. Intense pains which cannot be overcome. In none of these cases, one has to purge. Thank you. But in every other case, purging was indeed advised. In ancient Egyptian medicine, there was little distinction between magical and medical when it came to health and disease. Maybe falling off the wall was what broke your leg. Maybe it's because you're cheating on your wife and the gods aren't pleased about it. Maybe it was your wife pushing you that broke it, but we'll never know. Headache was treated using the skull of a catfish, which was burnt to ash and then boiled with oil. So it became a paste that you could smear across your whole head for four days. Um, which does actually sound like a cure I'd consider. Uh, I mean, even though it's likely that it's just the fact it takes four days to make it, that things just get better. The thinking was, however, that the catfish was the symbol of a demon who had once afflicted the god Horus with headaches of such intensity that they forced him to live in the dark. Bima. Thus, by killing and burning the catfish, you would be diminishing the demon's power, and Horus might help you. We then move to the traditional period, where they certainly had some interesting ideas about what would treat migraines. Uh, mainly bloodletting, which... I mean, they thought would cure just about everything. I understand the theory here. Often my migraines do feel like a huge pressure in my brain, as if my brain is just trying to escape from my skull that is rapidly shrinking and that the only thing to do is to make a hole somewhere that will allow a release of the built up tension. But generally, to be healthy, one does require one's blood, and purposefully giving someone a nosebleed does seem foolish. Eritreus's books from the first part of the second century give us our best knowledge about medicine from Roman times, and were in fact deeply influential for centuries afterwards. He advised bloodletting as a treatment for many diseases, and for headaches wrote that an artery of the forehead was to be opened. And if that didn't work, mm. skip ahead 30 seconds if you're squeamish. He bled sufferers from the nose, writing, Take the shaft of a thick goose feather, scrape off a bit from the outer layer, and make notches into the fibres, so that it results in teeth like on a saw. Subsequently, 
push the shaft inside the nose up to the ethmoid bones. Move it with both hands in order to create scratches at that site. Mm. In this way, a lot of blood will be discharged in a short time as many small veins end there and the site is soft and easy to injure. And if that didn't work, he suggested cuts that went to the bone as being beneficial. No thanks. No thanks. Sorry Romans, I mean your roads are great but I'm gonna have to give you a fail for this one. I also really, really hate the idea of getting leeches stuck on my face, as was practiced by the Tudors. Uh, and it would take a lot of money to convince me to try it, even if the Daily Mail says it will work. I mean, we'll see. No, I take it back. No amount of money will convince me. The withdrawal of bodily fluids in order to restore the balance of our bodies, also called eucrasis. Did I actually say that right? I did. Well done was part of humoral medicine. Humoral. Oh, and then I messed up humoral. Come on. Was part of humoral medicine in which health and disease was believed to be governed by the four humours. Blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile. Mm. Why does the word bile taste the way it sounds? Bile. Mm. Humoral substances were thus believed to be at an imbalance when the body had a problem and this must be rectified by withdrawing substances. And if you couldn't get blood out by breaking the skin, it was advised that you make blisters using an iron rod instead. Jeepers! Not much changed in subsequent centuries in Europe, although the Byzantines really were much better at medicine than everyone else and generally tried to avoid just bleeding people to death. Which is never a good look. Arabic medicine was much more advanced and they advised things like drinking more water, which was revolutionary at the time. An important person to mention here is Maimonides, who was born in 1135 in Cordoba, Spain. Did I say that right? Yes. But expelled for his radical ideas and instead became the court physician in Morocco and then moved to Cairo, where he became royal physician. He advised bloodletting until the headache was truly severe and then advised only a small amount of bloodletting from the pulsating arteries behind the ears. So. Hmm. Oh, sorry, did you think I was mentioning him because he's great? <laughs> oh no. One of his most popular methods for curing a headache, if bloodletting in the red hot iron hadn't worked, was to peel garlic, cut it in half, make an incision at the patient's temples, and then slide the garlic in. What? No! Who said okay to this? You know what? I think I'm good. I think I'll just keep my disgustingly painful forehead the way it is. Yes, I just smacked it. In the 17th century, the Amsterdam physician, Nicholas Tulp, who is depicted in Rembrandt's well-known anatomical lesson, wrote of a carpenter's wife suffering from a headache for a considerable period. Potentially related to never being called by her name and only instead referred to by her husband's profession. Just saying. She reported a warm feeling that ascended from her feet to her head and then back down to her big toe. Can you see where this is going? Oh, don't worry, he didn't just straight chop off her big toe. He burnt it and set the volatile spirits free. But apparently that helped, or, you know, she just told him it did so she didn't have to see him again. In the same century, Johann Jakob Wepfer advised shaving the skull and applying cantharidin plaster. Cantharidin, which is a word I really struggle to say, uh, is an odorless, colourless, fatty substance which is secreted by many species of blister beetles, so-called because they make other things blister. In large doses, it can burn or poison, but preparations containing it were historically used as aphrodisiacs. Of course they were. In its natural form, cantharidin is secreted by the male blister beetle and given to the female as a gift during mating. You're welcome. Golly, thanks. Afterwards, the female beetle covers her eggs with it as a defense against predators. And it's a really good defense. Whilst cantharidin is a significant veterinary concern, it's also clearly poisonous to humans if taken internally, which happens when people experimentally ingest it for the kicks. Because of course they do. The thing that still happens. Exposure causes severe chemical burns, but can be used therapeutically in small quantities. Although doctors in the 1600s found that they were accidentally causing a lot of dysuria cases by using it, Yes, yes, fun fact. Smearing beetle blister pus on your forehead can make it difficult to pee. Who knew? 
It's not until the 1700s when Gerard van Switten gives us an accurate description of what we now recognise as a cluster headache, um, although he actually called it a fever. He noted that the headaches were attended with a visible swelling, not only of the eye itself, but also that side of the forehead. I feel very seen right now. You may or may not have noticed, but I don't exactly have big eyes. In fact, they are so small that when I was a child, and we'd all talk about what bits of ourselves we'd fix with plastic surgery. Jesus, were we okay? My answer was always, make my eyes bigger, because I thought there might be things I was missing out on, seeing since, you know, half of my vision is just eyelashes. Hilariously, I then went blind in one eye, so I'm, I guess it's a lesson in appreciating what you have. That's not hilarious, I just have a strange sense of humour. Well, now my wife can tell that I'm about to get a migraine before I even know, because my eyes get even smaller, and around my forehead is very swollen, but I'm so used to just looking out through my tiny eyes, I can't even tell the difference. <laughs> I love watching footage back and being like, oh, Jessica, uh, um, your blind eyes closed. Like, can you? <laughs> I can't open that even if I try. No one is allowed to write, why do you wear false eyelashes then, in the comments because I am darn well allowed to inconvenience myself for the sake of my vanity. Prepare yourself for some more terrible advice from our old friend Eritreus, which were taken up again in the 1700s. Some physicians incise down to the bone on the forehead along the border of the hair. They abrade or chisel the bone down to the diplo and let flesh grow over the place. Ooh. Others perforate the bone down to the meninges. These are hazardous treatments. You have to apply them when the headache persists after all that has been done. The patient keeps courage and the body is vigorous. Okay, great, wonderful idea. Don't worry though, friends. Trepanation, otherwise known as drilling a burr hole into a person's skull for no good reason, was actually not as popular as you might have feared. Well, post-1600. And only for headaches, because obviously doctors were super happy to drill into the skulls of people they thought were mad or defective or sexually promiscuous. Click the icon in the top left hand corner of this video to watch my video about Rosemary Kennedy and lobotomies. Yeah. No, for headaches the opening of the skull was often advised but rarely applied unless other disease was observed. Only a few cases of trepanation for intolerable headache were reported in Western medicine, with the exception of headaches following a skull injury, when it was apparently very helpful. Um, maybe because the bones had shifted and they were shifting them back? I don't know. I don't know, I should ask my brother, he's an actual doctor. If you're interested in seeing what I would look like as a man, you can follow him on Instagram at medico.lifestyle. And yes, he inherited my share of the eyebrows. Other methods designed to cure migraines included the injection of soft oil into the ear, which probably did help if your headache was caused by a buildup of hard wax in your ears, I guess. Anyone else's mother put olive oil and cotton wool into their ears weekly? If you had grommets, be my friend. Another interesting treatment was recommended by the 10th century astronomer and physician Ali ibn Issa, who recommended binding a dead mole to the head. What did she do? More rationally, if diseases of the head occurred because of a faulty warm constitution, then bathing in comfortable warm sweet water was advised. And I, to be honest, highly recommend a relaxing warm bath with Dr. Teal's lavender Epsom salts because Works like a dream for tension headaches. I, if, equally, if the headache was localised, massaging oiled roses into the area was said to help. And it does. I mean, weirdly, I find more relief if I get Claudia to rub my face for me, but that might just be because I'm a deeply affectionate human being who craves physical touch. I mean, who knows? We then come to the 18th and 19th centuries and the application of electricity. Around the middle of the 18th century, scientists became aware of the electric nature of some fish. Although actually the court physician of Emperor Claudius had recognised the soothing effects of shocks from electric fish and recommended them for gout and headache. And that was like way before because nothing we do is actually new. However, the electric eel that was found in the northern parts of southern America gave off more powerful shocks than European and African fish, up to 600 volts. Thus, the conscious application of electricity was introduced into medicine. After they tested it on slaves, because of course that's what happened. Jesus. A letter in the treatise of the Harlem Society of Sciences from 1762 describes it thus. When a slave complains of a bad headache, he has them put one of their hands on their head and the other 
on the fish, and they thereby will be helped immediately without exception. <coughs> Electrical machines became widely applied for headaches and other afflictions. It was said that headaches could be cured by drawing sparks from that site for just 15 minutes. The French physician Pierre Barthelon, born in 1742, was among the many physicians at the time who applied electricity to himself. He believed that there was too great an amount of nervous fluid on the head and that applying negative electricity could help remove it. It wasn't until the middle of the 19th century that the scientific method finally conquered the humoral pathology and became the prevailing type of medicine. Experimental physiology became an important source for new medical knowledge. Physiology, by the way, is the scientific study of functions and mechanisms in a living system. It focuses on how organisms, organ systems, individual organs, cells, and biomolecules carry out the chemical and physical functions in a living system. Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who was England's first female physician in 1870 following medical studies in Paris, advised in her doctoral thesis, Sur la migraine. Migraine. Sally migraine. It's okay, you can roast me for that one. There are reasons to suppose that in migraine, as well as in other cases of severe and recurrent pain, the central lesion consists of imperfect nutrition of nervous tissues. The immediate result of it is a too rapid discharge of electricity inherent to nervous molecules. Mm. She believed that electricity, next to air and exercise, were the most effective treatment of migraine. Dr. William Hammond agreed in his 1889 book that electricity should be applied between attacks. Indeed, the daily use of a strong galvanic current of 4 to 8 MA, 8 to 10 cells, I don't know what that means, for 10 minutes is useful as constitutional treatment. I mean, I'm not saying I'll try it, but it helps. Unfortunately, later doctors have since debunked electric shocks to the head, however. Ah, so they've been found to give only temporary relief and not have permanent effects. Sad times for my tiny eye. One thing that does help, and this I can certainly recommend, is compressing your own common carotid artery on the painful side, right down to the thyroid cartilage. So much of the pulse from the temporal artery kind of starts to disappear and the head pain wears off. But if you do it on the other side, the headaches get worse. Oh, it does. Huh. If you're lying in bed, lie on the side that hurts, and you just kind of like basically use your pillow to crush your neck for you. Crushing your vagus nerve also helps, 10 out of 10, can recommend. Put a hard pillow behind your neck. Yeah, we'll just do the whole thing like this. It's the whole video now. Hydrotherapy is a non-drug treatment that has been applied for various afflictions, including headache, since antiquity, and it is still advised today. Pierre Adolphe Pierry in 1831 wrote a treatise on hermocrania in which he advised stimulation of the feet by warm water. A quick stimulation of the feet by warm water or firelight has sometimes stopped the migraine. Not great if your migraine is set off by heat, but you know, definitely something you might want to try otherwise. Oh, uh, maybe don't try the bath of hot mustard that was advised alongside that. That doesn't sound pleasant. In the early 20th century, the ear, nose and throat area was often considered to cause migraine. This led to the rise of surgery on the adenoids and tonsils. The German neurologist Hermann Oppenheim wrote about the treatment of chronic nasal diseases that partly relieved and even cured the attacks in some of the cases. However, it was warned that perhaps people should not get too excited by this as migraine is a constitutional problem and removing a single irritant does not mean that the migraines will not be re-sparked by something else. By the mid 20th century, there was a turn towards mainly drug treatments, although it was advised that any source of possible infection, be that in teeth, sinuses, tonsils, and so on, must be eradicated first. Other cures are, of course, all over the internet. Some are obvious, like an ice pack on your head. Some not so obvious, like staring into the sun. What? Weirdly, I once had a school teacher tell me that orgasms would cure both my insomnia and headaches and encouraged me to take care of that. Probably not something someone should say to a 14 year old, but hey, it was pre-2010 and these things seemed weirdly normal back then. Much like drilling into someone's head did in antiquity. Anyway, like a soccer mum with nine children but an inexplicable amount of time on her hands, I turned to Pinterest, which told me to drink a glass of lemon water with a healthy dose of pink salt. And I can't quite believe I'm doing this, but the interest of research and sparing you all the pain of doing it. Oh, <laughs> that's genuinely awful. I'm sick now. <laughs> I mean, it took my mind off. 
Pinterest is actually a really, really big fan of salt. Apparently it will just cure all of these problems. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't quite say how I'm supposed to use the salt, so um, I threw a lot of it around and now my wife's not very pleased at me. Yay. I can't say I'm feeling any better in my head either. Pivoting to the second favorite website of the strangely hippie yet also votes for 50s values mum, Facebook, where we find that a chip bag clip, which can't lie, I think is an exclusively American thing because I've never seen one of these sold in England, or do we just not have them here and everyone else does around the world? I don't know. Yes, so a chip bag clip might be the answer. Now this one I am actually feeling pretty positive about. My wife's late mother was an acupuncturist and Claude uses lots of pressure point techniques that she's learned from her to kind of stop her own nausea or make herself get tired. She's tried this migraine one for me before, but she tends to get bored before my migraine goes away, which is very fair as it normally takes an hour, but it's always more effective when someone else does it for you. So, wife, wife, that is quite helpful. Did I buy you that weird little clip thing? Did you buy me that? Did you? No, you said it looked freaky. Oh, but that would be easier than it did just look standing freaky. there. Yeah, well, don't worry though, it doesn't get too boring. Invasive procedures applied in the early 20th century include the lumbar puncture, also known as the spinal tap, and my most hated nemesis. The lumbar, oh, bye. <laughs> also known as a spinal tap, and my most hated nemesis. <laughs> The lumbar puncture is a medical procedure in which a needle is inserted into the spinal canal. This can be to collect cerebral spinal fluid for diagnostic purposes, but it can also be used to relieve fluid pressure. Um, <coughs> and now I have to take a moment to calm down and not vomit, because I find talking about lumbar punctures really distressing. And yes, I smile when distressed. Is that in any way shocking? So. I had a lumbar puncture when I was 17. It was under sedation, but that somehow, I don't know, makes it worse because I remember uh, quite distinctly and sharply every second leading up to them squirting the medicine in my mouth to knock me out. And then after that, I just know pain, a lot of pain because the lumbar puncture went wrong and I bled out a lot of my spinal fluid into my body over the course of a few days because no one checked on it. And it gave me a migraine that lasted for around two and a half years where I couldn't sit up or eat open my eyes or eat and um, I could be dosed up with painkillers and propped up for a few hours but I didn't really have much of a life and it's a very difficult period to look back on. She says like she can remember any of it. I mean, <laughs> I can't. I guess that's a plus point but not really. It makes it worse because I panic that people know things and experienced moments with me that they remember but I don't. Um, it's more like if I haven't seen someone for a while I get very nervous seeing them again because I'm aware that they remember the times we've spent together and I don't. I just have a general feeling. So I'm like, oh, I don't want to like tell them, you know, if I tell them a story, they'll be like, um, you already told me that five times. I'm like, awkward. Or just that it makes you feel very naked. Memory loss. It's a weird thing. Don't like it. it makes me feel sick in my stomach. Anyway, lumbar puncture. Glad it can be used to help people's migraines, so. Let's end the video here before I start crying and get more upset because I'm actually going to go and breathe in lots of fresh air on the top of a mountain, um, which honestly helps more than anything, so. I mean, if you're not any, hmm, <laughs> can't open my eyes, too busy vomiting everywhere, stages of a migraine anyway. Bye, okay. Bye, love you. Bye, bye. <laughs> Check one for my conflict avoidant personality. Bye. Comment below with other fun or not so fun girls for migraines you've had of. Bye, bye.